We started the No to Military Trials for Civilians uh, group in February 2011. Uh, very shortly after Mubarak had, uh, had stepped down. And actually Mona was the one who, who started it. Uh, and she started it because she had been part of uh, a sit-in in front of uh, the cabinet that was calling for uh, Ahmed Shafiq to step down as prime minister at the time. And uh, the, the sit-in was very violently uh, uh, ended by the military. And it was kind of a surprise to all of us because at that time the general feeling was that the military was, you know, the military and the people were one hand and, you know, we were kind of all together in this. And that was really the first time that we had seen firsthand how violently the military was cracking down on, on uh, protesters. Um, so Mona was in this sit-in with, uh, with a guy uh, by the name of Amr al-Bahiri who had been one of the, of the many people uh, in the sit-in. And, uh, you know, after, after it had been... Uh, uh, crashed down basically by, by the military, they were all going home and the military uh, detained Amr al-Bahiri. And so uh, Mona and her family, her mother in particular, who is a, a well-known activist in Egypt and a university professor, uh, spoke to the officers for about 10 minutes, uh, you know, reasoned with them of why are you taking this young man, he was just, you know, with us. Um, and so they left him, they, they let him go. Uh, and, you know, they parted and went their separate ways. Ten minutes later, they got a phone call that uh, the officers went around, went back and detained Amr al-Bahiri. Uh, three days later, Amr al-Bahiri was uh, sentenced to five years in, in jail. Uh, the trial basically took place in the kitchen of the military prosecutor's office. Uh, no lawyers present. Uh, nobody informed his family. They don't know anything about his whereabouts. And the guy suddenly got five years in jail. Uh, Mona was really moved by this experience and she decided that she that something has to be done so she started you know getting around some of her you know activist friends and and started this effort of, uh, of no to military trials and it's been really wonderful um, it's it's been I, th I think it's been one of the most successful uh, activist efforts uh, probably partly because the cause is uh, uh, well, I, I don't want to say non-controversial, because really at the beginning a lot of people didn't believe that the military was doing this. Uh, especially when we started, you know, giving them the numbers of close to 12,000 people being uh, uh, subjected to military trials, and a lot of people thought we were exaggerating. Up until the point in late August of last year, when we basically forced the Supreme Council of Armed Forces to come out and do a press conference and say the numbers that they had, and the numbers were 11,970 something, so very close to the, to the numbers that we had uh, estimated. Um, and that effort has been going on uh, ever since. I think it's been very successful in just creating awareness of that this is actually happening, uh, gathering support behind it. It's, it's been amazing and Mona has been definitely the, the number one drive and the number one force uh, behind it. Threats and challenges is Mona facing as a She's she's very active. I mean, Mona is uh, Mona is a is a very active activist. Uh, so she's she's there in, in every single protest. She I don't know how she keeps up with the with the with the numbers of, of you know people detained because most of these families people just feel safe when they talk to her personally because she's also a very amicable and a very approachable person uh, and she knows every little detail of every little family that has been through through this ordeal it's just it's amazing uh, for me it's been amazing to watch her uh, you know and, and uh, I'm honestly I'm, I'm in awe sometimes I just keep watching and I don't know how she, how she does that uh, and does she face any particular threats yes I mean you know most activists are, are threatened all the time and she's she's no exception she has been detained and and beaten by the army in December of last year uh, in in one of the you know one of the uh, sit-ins one of the protests and and she's under that threat at, at all times uh, her family is very high profile they're all high profile activists and so uh, you know they're they're all basically under the risk of being um, you know, detained or, or threatened at any moment uh, to sort of uh, try to control the the amount of uh, of effect that they uh, that they cause or, uh, and that they do with with the activists. Um, and it's it's been just amazing to watch the spirit and the determination and and the real love for the cause. You know, it's like I'm I'm on this mission. She cannot stand to see injustice. She.
she is just immediately moved and she's moved in the right direction and that's that's the amazing thing because you know uh, I mean she's she's relatively young right she's in her mid-20s so how do, how do you do that I was I was watching her uh, this past February February 26th we had a press conference for you know our one year anniversary of the NOTA military trials group and I was just watching her during the press conference taking care of the details and all I could think of how does a 25 year old female say to herself you know what I don't like this military trials thing I think this is wrong I'm going to personally stand up to the Supreme Council of Armed Forces and I'm going to do something about that and then a year later she manages to get the whole country behind her you know I mean politicians presidential candidates parliament uh, members uh, singers performers just people out on the streets how do you do that how do you get the spirit and the determination and the courage to do that to say, you know, I, in my mid-twenties, I'm going to stand up to the, to the ruling Supreme Council of Armed Forces of the country. And then you actually manage to gather people behind you and to do something. It's amazing. What is the environment like for women human rights defenders in Egypt today? And given the verdict, uh, given the, the recent verdict in the virginity trust case, what's the environment like? Women have been very active in, uh, in the Egyptian revolution. It's been one of, uh, you know, one of the very positive discoveries of, uh, of our society, of, of, uh, of how many women came out and the great things that, uh, that they were doing out on the streets and, and uh, in every cause, really. Uh, and the, you know, the, the not the military trials is actually mostly women. Uh, our, our nickname is sometimes, you know, women against the, the military <laughs> because we're, we're mostly women. Uh, but we, we were all very moved, of course, by the virginity test case because that was, again, that was relatively early on. That was March 9th of last year. So again, less than a month after Mubarak had stepped down. And the problem was a lot of people did not believe that this had happened because it was just so out of the ordinary and out of everything that we had heard of before. Uh, and so our, our first mission was to, first of all, to try to get one of the girls to actually speak on camera and, and say that this had happened to, you know, to be uh, courageous enough to come, to come out and say that this has happened to her. And that's no easy matter. Uh, and, then to, and then to get the whole society to believe that this actually happened and to take the matter to court. And, and, and so it was a, it was a long, uh, hard fight. Uh, and Samira Ibrahim, of course, was at the heart of that. And she's just another example of these wonderful, wonderful young women uh, that, uh, who we learned about uh, in, the, in the midst of the revolution. Um, I think she's done a, a great deal of good by taking this to, to court. Uh, the, the administrative court has ruled in her favor, has ruled, has acknowledged that this has happened, number one, and has uh, ruled that this cannot happen again, that this is illegal and cannot happen again. And that, I think, is a major, major accomplishment. Of course, when matters went to a military trial after that, the military trial proved the, the officer innocent, the doctor, doctor who actually did this. Uh, but but I think the administrative court ruling is uh, is enough of a victory for her at, at this point in time and you know because it just guarantees that this is not going to happen again to somebody else and again a great example of what women can do in, in the revolution so what would you say is and you've touched on this a little bit already but the, um, the strategy of Mona and, and no military trials in terms of engaging the Egyptian public we our first challenge was how to how to spread awareness of this how to tell people that there have been over 12,000 civilians subjected to military trials. You know, over Mubarak's 30 years of rule, the number of people subjected to military trials are estimated between one to 2,000. So we are right now, at, actually as of August of last year, we were at 12,000. So it's, the numbers are humongous. Uh, so the number one thing we did was try to, you know, gather uh, media uh, attention as much as possible, uh, do press conferences, get the testimonies of the people who have been subjected to these uh, ordeals to speak on camera. We have a YouTube channel. Uh, uh, many of our uh, videos are uh, also subtitled to English so that the international community can, can see what's happening because that's also been very important to just gather you know, international support for this cause and to spread awareness that this is happening. Uh, uh, we try to blog on, on international uh, domains like, you know, uh, index for censorship, uh, frontline, whatever, whatever we can, you know, uh, to, to, to spread the word basically internationally. Uh, but also to, to locally make people understand 
what an unjust ordeal this is for anybody to go through. Uh, and, and so that was our number one effort. We, we had uh, stickers printed out with our uh, logo in yellow, and these have become very, very popular, I'm happy to say. Uh, we, we have pictures of them, you know, sometimes even on the, on the uh, doors of houses of military officers, <laughs> or sometimes their family members, their sons or daughters or, you know, whatever, somebody in the family just sticks that on their door, literally underneath the name of the officer. So we're very happy and very proud of that. Um, but but it, it has been quite significant in spreading awareness that this is happening. And then, of course, we have protests on, you know, out in the streets. We try to put uh, a name and a face to the cases. And so we try to, we try to have as many high-profile cases as possible. We try to speak about them uh, in, in the media every chance that we get. Uh, we, we, we hold press conferences after these people come out for them to actually talk to the media and, and say in person what has happened uh, to them. Uh, you know, it's, it's mostly based on the media and it's based on spreading awareness. The more you can get the word out uh, through local means and through international means, that, that's really your way out of things like that. So what do you think is the significance of international recognition? I mean, for example, like this nomination for Frontline Defenders Award, what's the significance of that for human rights defenders in Egypt, and, and particularly at a time when NGOs are being targeted? I think the Frontline Defenders Award would, would really help us a great deal at this, at this point. First of all, Mona deserves it, I mean, you know, that's, that's one thing, uh, really, she does. But, but the thing is, uh, it would also bring attention to a great deal of the issues. Like right now, we're starting a new campaign for military trials for minors, you know, children under the age, legally, that's under the age of 18 in, in Egypt. There have been people you know, uh, 11 and, and 12 and 13 years of age tried in, in military courts. So we, we need to get the attention of the media, international media, on these people. We need to, to create awareness that this is happening because it's really pressure that, that uh, moves SCAF to do anything at the end of the day. So the more you can do that, the more you can get people to, to talk about it, uh, you know, and that's, that's partly why the, the virginity test case was, was so popular, because the, the movie that we, uh, the testimony that we recorded, which was subtitled onto English, has close to, ha to half a million uh, hits on it. I mean, half a million views, and that's, that's just been amazing. So the more you spread the word and the more you, you get the international community to talk about it, uh, the more you actually have a chance of, of creating something, of, uh, of doing something. So, you know, I mean, it's, it's a long road ahead. We still have uh, a few thousand people in, in jail um, from military trials that we're trying to, to get out. And then we're actually trying to get everybody who had been subjected to a military trial, even if they're out, uh, we're trying to get them uh, either retried or just the sentences totally dropped because these people did not do anything to begin with. And now they have a criminal record, you know, even if they are at home. But they either have a sentence that they have actually served or they have uh, uh, a sentence uh, that has been stayed, that has been stopped. But, but they do have a criminal record for having done nothing. And it's, it's just not right. And, and it's such a huge number of, uh, uh, of people who, some, I mean, some of them were just happened to be passing by at the wrong place at the wrong time. You know, I mean, it, it, we just have all sorts of hilarious stories. You know? And when we apply for appeal for some of these people, I mean, we have, we have, we have a guy recently, a 19-year-old guy, who was sentenced to 25-year-old, 25-year uh, uh, sentence in, you know, in, in a military trial. And when we appealed, he was, he was out, he was innocent, he was ruled innocent. So how do you, how do, you do that? I mean, what, what, a, what kind of a mistake is this, to sentence somebody to life in prison, 25 years, a 19-year-old person? So how many people are like that in, in military prisons that we need to, to cast a light on and, and uh, put as much pressure as possible and alert the international community that this is happening so that these people can, can get out and can have their sentences dropped, really, at the end of the day. Can you say just a few words about what makes Mona unique as a human rights defender? I think I personally am very lucky to have known Mona. I mean, uh, she's just a really, truly one-of-a-kind uh, person. I'll, I'll give you a couple, of, a couple of examples of just images that I, that I keep seeing. Um, you know, her brother is a, is a very high-profile activist, Ala Abdel Fattah, and he was also detained in a military trial. And he actually took a step further and he said, you know what, I'm not speaking to a military tribunal. I refuse to be interrogated. Uh, 
so her, her brother is a very high profile uh, activist, Ala Abdel Fattah, and he himself has been subjected to a, a military trial in the, in the Maspiro case. And he, he took things one step further, though. He said, you know what, I'm not speaking before a, a military tribunal. I do not recognize this. I'm a civilian. I should not be here. I'm not cooperating. I'm not saying anything. And he knew that this basically meant that he was not going home that day, that he would be detained. To make matters worse, his wife, Manal, who's also a high-profile activist, was nine months pregnant at that point. Uh, actually, at that point, she was eight months pregnant. But, you know, I mean, we knew where this was, was going. Uh, I was with Manel and with Mona outside the military prosecutor's office uh, in December when Mona was actually over nine months pregnant. <laughs> she was really overdue at that point. And we were hoping this was like the last chance for an appeal for Ala to, to be out pending investigation because there was nothing against him, you know. It was totally a, a political case. Um, and that appeal was rejected. And so it was a very sad moment for all of us. You know, I was sitting on some stairs on a, you know, in a building right outside the military office next to Manal. And I couldn't find anything to say. You know, I mean, what, what do I say to her? You know, she's, she has to give birth now because she's been waiting and trying to extend, uh, you know, the time as much as possible for Ala to come out. And all of a sudden I was like, where's Mona? You know, I'm, uh, and I'm trying to, and I kind of stood up and, and looked around to see where she was. And there she was sitting in a corner, surrounded by about maybe 20 to 30 people of, you know, your, your typical, you know, um, under the poverty line Egyptians who are actually the, the majority of the 12,000 people who are in military courts. And she's just sitting there with her notebook, taking the personal information of every single case of these people. And I was just blown away, you know, I mean, how do you, how do you do that at this particular moment when I can't cope with the pain? You know, this is your brother. But she somehow finds salvage in the hope of helping other people get over their pain. And it's it, it just, it's amazing. I mean, it really blew my mind away. And I've seen just, I can give you examples and examples and examples of things like that. This is just who she is. She, she does it so naturally. She doesn't think twice. This is just the, like the first thing that comes to her mind is how do I help others? How do I help this person? How do I, you know, what do I do that? Uh, and it, it's actually quite funny because some of her friends sometimes say, you know what, you're too humane. And I just, I mean, I, I wish everybody was was too humane. You know, I wish I wish we had more Monas in in the world. It would definitely be a, a much better place.